Good afternoon. I hope I'm live. Uh, welcome, please, to another uh, webinar of ARN Rita lunch webinars on Tuesday. I, my name is Bas Vastet. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist, immunologist in um, the Utrecht Medical Center in the Netherlands. And we have, on behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Alice Hachuel from uh, Paris, I um, welcome you to this uh, very interesting topic. We have a, um, a famous speaker from uh, Italy, Dr. Uh, Claudia Bacaglia, whom I know very well. It's my pleasure to introduce you. Uh, Dr. Bacaglia um, is a staff member of um, uh, the Bambino Gesù Hospital in Rome in the division of uh, Professor De Benedetti. She's a specialist in uh, pediatric rheumatology, trained also in Boston. Uh, she focuses now on severe systemic GAA and its complications like macrophage activation syndrome and uh, interstitial lung disease. She also leads a uh, European registry of um, interstitial lung disease patients uh, within uh, that disease, systemic GAA. Um, and she's actually um, the current chair of the Mass Systemic GAA Working Party of PRESS, one of the four uh, member organizations, of course, of ARN Rita. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, her uh, to you. And Claudia, please share your screen and give the presentations. Thank you, Bas, for the kind introduction. And thank you to organizer for inviting me today to have this talk. So <clears throat> the topic uh, is quite challenging. And uh, I, I have tried to address it uh, as best as possible from the pediatric rheumatologist's point of view. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it works fine. Very good. Okay. So uh, interstitial lung disease is a rare manifestation, different rheumatic disease in childhood, and causes significant morbidity and mortality. Children are often asymptomatic until disease progression, and diagnosis can be difficult and delayed. So ILD is most frequently in connective tissue diseases, followed by vasculitis, auto-inflammatory disorders, and granulomatous disease. So connective tissue diseases are more frequently complicated by ILD uh, in children under lupus, systemic sclerosis, Sjogren, uh, juvenile dermatomyositis, misconnective tissue disease, and systemic GIA. Uh, pulmonary vasculitis uh, associated with interstitial lung disease usually affect small vessels, while vasculitis targeting large and medium vessels uh, only occasionally can involve the lung. Auto-inflammatory disorders can also be revealed by isolated ILD, and sarcoidosis is the most frequent cause of granulomatosis ILD. So here, the uh, all pediatric rheumatology condition that can be complicated by ILD. So as you can see, we have many diseases that can be had this complication. And of course, I cannot discuss all these diseases today with you. So I will be focused on juvenile dermatomyositis, SAVI and COPA syndrome, and systemic GIA. Because I mean that these diseases are those that we are more frequently see and that are still very challenging to treat. So the rate of interstitial lung disease in adult patients with dermatomyositis is approximately 30%. Most patients have slow progression of interstitial lung disease, while some exhibit a rapidly progressive disease with uh, uh, a deterioration of the respiratory state very rapidly in two, three months from the disease onset. Uh, the high incidence of a rapid progressive interstitial lung disease in patients with dermatomyositis is, uh, with, is with clinical amniotic dermatomyositis form with positive anti-MDA5 autoantibodies. And uh, um, rapid progressive in inter uh, interstitial lung disease in clinically amniotic dermatomyositis is extremely difficult to treat because it's associated with a severe course and high mortality rate. So almost all the patients with the positivity of the anti-MDA5 antibody have clinical amniotic dermatomyositis with a high incidence of acute or subacute ILD. Uh, of course, ILD is more rare in juvenile dermatomyositis, affecting up to 14% of patients. But also in, uh, in children, there is an association with specific antibodies, particularly the anti-tRNA synthetase antibodies, so the anti-JO1 and anti-PL12, anti-RO52 and anti-MDA5. 
The lung histopathology in children is devoid of vasculitic contribution, and the lung fibrosis may present as interstitial alveolar or small airways obstruction. So lung disease in juvenile dermatomyositis is clinical as characterized by decreased total lung capacity and DLCO. 37% of the patient have high resolution CT abnormalities, including ILD, chest well calcinosis, and airway disease. And uh, the high resolution CD abnormalities usually correlate with cumulative organ damage and then to related quality of life. So here are some features from the um, high resolution CT scan in a patient with uh, lung involvement in juvenile dermatomyositis. As you can see, there is an interstitial, uh, diffuse interstitial um, involvement of the lung with fibrosis uh, in, the, in the last picture. And uh, histologically, uh, the patient had uh, um, a, a chronic inflammation with the, the mucosa with uh, um, more neutrophil infiltration uh, in the lung. So about the pathogenesis, actually, we don't know uh, all yet, so it's not completely understood. Serum cytokine levels are potentially uh, suitable biomarkers for dermatomyositis, rapid progressive interstitial lung disease, but actually a relationship between the cytokine levels, lung imaging, and lung pathology has not yet been investigated. Uh, some authors are starting to evaluate the association between hypercytokinemia and lung inflammation in adult patients with dermatomyositis. <clears throat> the mortality in JDM is lower than 10%, but of course the prognosis is poor in patients with positive anti-MD5 uh, antibodies with a mortality rate up to 25%. So treatment is characterized by the intensive therapy with egg dose glucocorticoid, intravenous cyclophosphamide and cyclosporin A. Uh, the use of traclodimus and rituximab in this condition is reported, but actually uh, it's effective, it needs to be confirmed. Uh, but new insights in the pathogenesis of uh, dermatomyositis related lung disease open the possibility to new targeted therapies. So I'm going to show you some uh, interesting reports on the role of some uh, cytokine in uh, pathogenesis of uh, lung disease in patients with dermatomyositis. So in this, uh, um, in this study, the authors found that uh, the interferon gamma levels are significantly high in patients with dermatomyositis with rapid progressive lung disease compared to patients with dermatomyositis without lung disease and healthy control. Moreover, they found that uh, interferon gamma levels correlate with the CTG score. This score is uh, the ground glass opacity CT score that uh, uh, relates with the changes in the acute and active phase. They found also a correlation between IL-1 beta, but this correlation was with the fibrosis score, that is uh, um, a score for the chronic uh, phase changes. In this uh, other uh, manuscript, the authors uh, found that neuterine serum levels are significantly high in dermatomyositis patients compared to LT control, and also uh, neuterine correlates significantly with serum ferritin level. Moreover, the serum neuterine level are significantly high in patients with rapid progressive interstitial lung disease compared to patients with lung disease non rapid progressive and patients without lung involvement. And finally, in this third manuscript, the authors found that the ileting levels are significantly high in patients with dermatomyositis with interstitial lung disease compared with patients without lung involvement. And also, ileting levels correlated with the grade of uh, disease uh, severity and activity, and also with the global uh, visual analog score in this patient. So uh, these data are quite relevant, relevant because suggests that the interferon gamma pathway can, can have uh, an important role in the pathogenesis of dermatomyositis. Uh, in fact, interferon gamma levels are high in patients with rapid progressive interstitial lung disease with dermatomyositis and correlate with lung CT changes in the acute and active phase. Neuterine levels are high in dermatomyositis and related with rapid progressive lung disease, and also elevating levels are significant high in patients with interstitial lung disease and dermatomyositis and correlated with disease activity. 
So we now move on lung disease in auto-inflammatory disease. So the lung is one of the target organs of uh, auto-inflammatory disease. Uh, interstitial lung disease is the primary phenotype of lung involvement, particularly in type 1 interferonopathies. COPA and SAVI are, of course, the uh, two interferonopathies that are most commonly associated with lung involvement. So the interferon genes associated vasculopathy with onset in infancy, that's called SAVI, is an autosomal dominant or sporadic auto-inflammatory disease caused by gain of function mutation in the TMM 173 gene, which encodes the sting protein. SAVI is clinically characterized by systemic inflammation, severe cutaneous lesions, which progress to acral necrosis and interstitial lung disease. The diagnosis is uh, almost clinical because uh, the, uh, the skin involvement in the face and in the uh, hands, in the distal involvement, uh, is very typical. So it's, it's easy uh, for pediatric rheumatology to identify uh, clinically a patient with uh, SAMI disease. But lung involvement is always present in those patients uh, while uh, the skin may be absent. So uh, the digital clubbing is very common in this patient. So if you, if you find a patient with digital clubbing, with without skin that can happen, you can also exclude the SAVI disease. The great majority of SAVI patients have interstitial lung disease, in fact. The initial pulmonary physical examination findings can be just tachypnea, chronic cough, and digital clapping. Pulmonary fissures should be carefully looked for in these patients, and uh, there are few cases in which lung involvement can be present without extra pulmonary manifestation. Here, uh, the CT from one of our patients with SAVI, uh, with SAVI disease and lung involvement. As you can see here, ground, ground opacities and fibrosis. And this is the, the disease progression after one year with the interstitial fibrosis and subpleurical microcystis. So lung involvement in SAVI is probably due to the expression of the sting protein, also in the alveolar type 2 pneumocystis and in bronchial epithelium and in the alveolar macrophages. The mechanism underlying the severe lung disease in those patients is not fully understood, and SAVI has been regarded as type 1 interferonopathy. So the relative, the relative contribution of the three interferon receptors are still incompletely understood. And uh, what about coatomer protein complex syndrome? So, well, better known as COPA syndrome. So, this disease is caused by heterozygous mutation in COPA gene that encodes for the subunit alpha of the coatomer complex one, that is a, a regulator of vesicular retrograde transport between Golgi and the endoplasmic reticulum. So the disease usually onset in early childhood, usually before the age of five with polyarticular arthritis, progressive lung disease and kidney involvement. So the majority, um, the, the most uh, important feature of COPA syndrome are recurrent immunomediated diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and interstitial lung disease that usually uh, onset uh, later. So initial symptoms can be hemoptysis, shortness of breath, chronic cough, and dyspnea. And the physical examination findings can be refraction, crackles, and clubbing. So here are two patients with COPA uh, with progression of lung disease from grind glass opacities and fibrosis and cystis. So in both of them, you can see this disease progression in the lung. And from the histology point of view, this patient can have signs of acute hemorrhages, as here, or chronic hemorrhages. So mutations in COPA gene are responsible of type 1 interferon induction. A strong upregulation of interferon type 1 genes has been reported in these patients. And the expression of mutant COPA results in the endoplasmic reticulum stress and the upregulation of cytokines priming for a TL per 70 response that is implicated in autoimmunity. So this disease has characteri is characterized by um, autoimmunity and autoinflammation. Both the endoplasmic reticulum stress and the TL per 17 cells have been implicated in patients with interstitial lung disease and inflammatory arthritis in other conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. So the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease in SAVI and COPA uh, is essentially done by um, high resolution chest CT, that is the standard technique for confirming interstitial lung disease. Bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar leverage are needed to rule out infection. 
lung biopsy is, is of course the gold standard for diagnosis, but is of course an invasive exam. Pulmonary, pulmonary functional tests, six minute working tests, and night pulse asymmetry are used to assess ILD severity and response to treatment. Uh, and to note that Savi and COPA should be ruled out in all patients with the interstitial lung disease of unknown origin. So what about treatment? Uh, inhibition of the interferon signaling with JAK inhibitor was the first described treatment in SAVI, uh, with a different clinical result reported depending on which JAK inhibitor is used. Uh, Ruxonit inhib and Barishit inhib has been reported to be effective uh, both in SAVI and COPA patients, while Tofacit inhib did not show any clinical improvement in SAVI patients, but of course this data came from just case reports. So this is again the patient that I showed you before. Uh, as you can see, after one year, the patient had the pro disease progression of interstitial fibrosis with the development of subclavar microcystis, and it happened while on ruxolitinib. So we are, of course, uh, far from the um, uh, right treatment of the gold uh, standard treatment for this condition. Um, again, we have some uh, uh, interesting data from, uh, um, from the lab, from the mouse model, uh, that can uh, open the opportunity to um, uh, probably uh, think about different treatment. So these are two uh, manuscripts on two different mouse models, a mouse model of SAVI disease, that suggests uh, an important role of the interferon gamma pathway in the pathogenesis of lung involvement in this condition. So this is the uh, VU154M SAVI mouse, VUM SAVI. And uh, as you can see here, uh, spleen T cells of these mice, uh, stimulated with CD3 and CD8 cells, um, produce a large amount of interferon gamma compared to the white type. And here are T cells from lung, uh, lung tissue that again produce interferon gamma but without any stimulus. And moreover, the um, interferon gamma receptor contributes to mortality in this mouse model. So as you can see here, uh, M FM savvy mice um, knockout for the interferon gamma receptor had a better survival. Had, sorry, had a better survival. Moreover, levels of chemokines, in particular CXL9, were significantly reduced in this mouse model when uh, the T cell were depleted and particularly when depleted the interferon gamma receptor. If this not, with, uh, did not happen with the uh, interferon uh, in uh, mice, the, the, the red plot, and the, in the in, um, interferon alpha receptor uh, knockout. Uh, in the second manuscript, the author found that interferon gamma receptor promotes immune dysregulation and uh, uh, disease in the, this uh, different mice model of SAVI. And as you can see here, here uh, there is uh, an improvement in lung disease in SAVI mice with the uh, interferon gamma receptor deletion. And this is not happen in the interferon alpha receptor deletion and interferon lambda. And the survival of the interferon gamma receptor knockout savi mice is improved. And uh, moreover, uh, bone marrow derived microphages have an increased response to interferon gamma with uh, uh, increased CXL9 expression. So together, all, all this data in, the, in uh, these two different mice models of SAVI suggest that the interferon gamma uh, pathway play a major role compared to the type 1 interferon in the pathogenesis of lung involvement in this condition, because uh, there are high levels of interferon gamma and interferon gamma genes, uh, induced genes. Uh, the deletion of interferon gamma receptor leads to improve in lung disease and survival. High levels of interferon gamma induced chemokines have been demonstrated demonstrated in these mice, and moreover, there is a natural response of macrophages to interferon gamma. So we now move to the systemic GIA. Systemic GIA is a unique childhood inflammatory disease characterized by both auto-inflammation and autoimmune deficiencies. The clinical phenotype is different from the other forms of SGIA, and the pathogenic understanding is still limited. Typical features of SGIA are fever, rash, arthritis, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and enterocytis. And macrophage activation syndrome is a severe life-threatening complication of SGIA that can be present at onset or at any time during disease course. 
So Lyme disease is a new emerging severe life-threatening complication of SGIA, historically present in 1-2% of SGIA patients, but actually uh, has been increased, uh, increasing reported in the last 10 years from 5 to 10%. Uh, these patients have a typical rash, typical imaging, uh, characteristic histology with significant inflammatory infiltrate, and the mortality is reported to be quite high, uh, up to 50% of the patient. Uh, lung involvement is associated with young age at onset and MAS, with often recurrent episodes. So as you can see here, the rash is, uh, is Typical is more uh, orticarioid, very itchy, and these patients have clubbing and uh, erythema uh, hyperemia of the periungual uh, fingers. So here are some findings uh, of, from high-resolution chest CT of patients with systemic GIA in the lung involvement. Uh, we can have uh, pleural thickening, three uh, blunt opacities, uh, more extensive pleural thickening, um, uh, consolidation, fibrosis and consolidation, again consolidation, and uh, uh, there is a, a very extensive involvement on the lung. So here again, uh, thickening, uh, some cystis and the consolidation with fibrosis. This is one of uh, our patients with systemic GIA lung disease. Um, at onset, uh, the patient presented with uh, ground glass opacities and uh, after six months he had a progression with uh, fibrosis. This is another, another patient, again, interstitial, septal thickening at onset, and then very rapidly, on, um, um, uh, um, very uh, rapid uh, evolvement to uh, fibrosis. The histopathologic features of lung disease in SJA is very uh, specific, with uh, a pattern of endogenous lipoid pneumonia, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, vasculopathy, chronic inflammation, and fibrosis. Uh, the pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is very typical of lung involvement uh, in SJA. The air spaces are filled with granular lipoproteinaceous material with foaming macrophages and cholesterol clefts. And the pattern is very similar to pulmonary alveolar proteinosis and is caused by the impairability of alveolar macrophages to catabolize surfactant. Uh, the uh, lymphocytic infiltrate is a mixture of B and T cells, but the T cells are predominant. And data from patients uh, uh, suggest that uh, uh, there is uh, um, an activation of the interferon gamma pathway in this patient. In fact, from, uh, these are data from the, the group of Cincinnati that show that lung tissue from patients with SJA had a predominant CD4TL per lymphocyte, and they had, the patient had also high levels of iletin in the bronchalveolar leverage. Moreover, the gene expression profiling from the lung biopsies show strong T cells uh, genes activation and the activation of the interferon gamma induced uh, genes. Uh, similar data was also demonstrated in two different mouse models. This is a toll like receptor induced mouse model of MIS. Uh, in this model, there is a T cell interstitial infiltration, particularly in perivascular and peribronchial areas. Uh, this mouse had also uh, a CD4 positive infiltrate more than CD8, and also a uh, cytokine profiles shows uh, high levels of interferon gamma and the interferon gamma induced chemokine, CXL9 and CXL10. This is another mouse model of MIS, is a T-BET. Uh, the T-BET usually overexpress, uh, are overexpressed in T cells and induce a lung, PAP, a lung PAP like um, uh, involvement with inflammatory infiltrates. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, the, the survival in this mouse model is uh, very, uh, um, very low compared to the white type, and uh, there is uh, high levels of inflammatory cytokines in the ball of. This mouse and uh, an overexpression of M1 and M1 related genes in the, um, in the ball. So, uh, probably is the activation of the IL18 interferon gamma axis a connection between SJA lung disease and MAS? 
because we have some data in this, uh, in, in this direction. Iletin is present in the bowel fluid in SGA patients with lung disease. Uh, the biopsy shows an interferon gamma signature. So probably there is a hepatophysiology overlapping in the pathway between SGA and M uh, lung disease and MAS in SGA. Uh, interferon gamma and aletin have emerged as, as uh, pivotal cytokine and promising also therapeutic target in MAS in SGA. Um, patients with lung disease uh, have currently uh, MAS, uh, particularly with a recurrent episode. And the inflammatory cytokine that drives MIS may also promote uh, alveolar macrophage dysfunction, leading to the PIP like phenotype. So this is one of the hypotheses, but there, there were proposed different hypotheses on the uh, pathogenic mechanism of lung disease in SGA. Uh, another hypothesis is the DRESS hypothesis that was proposed uh, one year ago, uh, because uh, um, some authors found that uh, patients with uh, lung disease, MGA lung disease, had a drug reaction, particularly related to IL-1 and 6 inhibitors, uh, system, with systemic features, so like a DRESS reaction. And those patients, um, currently uh, have um, an HLA DRB1 15 positive allele. So in the DRESS hypothesis, the, the, the authors uh, of course found that these patients had um, DRESS symptoms. They also uh, have an HLA, uh, positive, an HLA positivity for the B115. A 65% of these patients had lung, lung disease. Of course, uh, there, there was in this court a, patient, a number of patients without lung involvement, but those patients uh, were negative for the B115 allele. So based on the address hypothesis, the uh, inhibition with IL-1 and IL-6 blockers is responsible to a uh, response of TLPR2 and the uh, DRESS response with the activation of the, um, the features of MAS and lung involvement. So in this case, the drug uh, has like an antigen to, uh, uh, to cause uh, the, the disease response. But uh, very recently, uh, another uh, hypothesis has been proposed is the T-cell plasticity, that is a uh, um, again, related to the use of IL-1 and IL-6 inhibition. But in this case, the hypothesis is, this, is that these drugs can induce a deviation from the T helper 17 to the T helper 1, T helper 2. So the drug have a biologic effect uh, also to, to cause uh, the disease. So we actually don't know uh, if uh, IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors contribute totally to SGA lung disease, but we have some, uh, um, um, some point uh, in favor and some point uh, contra. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, um, um, the incidence of SGA lung disease uh, has uh, increased with the, the increased use of IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors. So most of the uh, um, SGA patients with lung disease have received this drug, and many of them have clinical reactions to drug, particularly to tocilizumab. Um, most of these patients have often hyperacinophilia, and some patients improved when this drug were stopped. But on the other hand, we have some SGA patients with lung disease that were never treated with L1 and 6 inhibitors. Some patients also are stable or improve during treatment with L1 and L6 inhibitors. And there is, a, a, and the incidence varies despite similar HLA and drug exposure. So I mean that we don't have enough data to, 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 um, to answer to this question. And we, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't say that we need to uh, stop uh, this drug uh, when the patient develop lung disease. So uh, based on this and based to the fact that the majority of the patients with lung disease and SGA were reported in North America, as a, a mass SGA working party of the Pediatric Rheumatology European Society, we have decided to collect lung disease in SGA in Europe. So, so uh, through the, the mailing list of the working party, we reach a number of Pediatric Rheumatology European Center and we collected data from 49 SGA, SGA patients complicated by lung disease. 
So clinical characteristics are very similar to uh, patients from North America. Even the age at onset in, in our cohort is a little bit higher, but clinical manifestations are, are similar. All, all, the patient, all the patients in, um, in Europe have history of MIS with recurrent episode. Uh, as well as lung fissures are very similar. Interstitial lung disease is the most common uh, lung fissures, and uh, as well as uh, clinical manifestation and uh, uh, chest CT fissures. Also, patients in the European court have high hyaluronic levels, particularly at time of lung disease diagnosis, as well as eosinophil set onset. Uh, the majority of the patients were, uh, were already treated with L1 and 6 inhibitors before the lung disease diagnosis, and some of them, 40%, have drug adverse reaction to cytokine inhibitor. But in the European court, we have seven patients did not receive IL-1 and 6 inhibitors before lung disease diagnosis, and uh, all of these patients had uh, interstitial lung disease with acute digital clubbing with the same manifestation of the other patient. Uh, treatment were very heterogeneous. The majority of the patients received glucocorticoid. Uh, IL-1 and 6 inhibitors were also added after lung disease diagnosis in some of the patients. And also the patient received JAK inhibitors and four of them hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Here the outcome, uh, half of the patients uh, were in clinical inactive disease at last follow-up, 35% of them had an improvement of the lung involvement, and uh, 31 of them have few complications related to lung disease, and 18% uh, uh, of the patients in our cohort died. Uh, moreover, um, in our center in Rome, we have decided to analyze the hla drb 115 allele in, uh, in our SGIA patients. So we collected uh, samples and we tested this allele from in uh, 98 SGIA patients following our center. And we found that 20% of our patients were positive for the RB115. Um, they have a lower, um, younger age at disease onset. Female uh, distribution, uh, gender distribution was similar in the two groups, as well as the arthritis at onset. Patient DRB115 positive and more refractory as JAE courts, and the entire court was exposed to L1 and 6 inhibitors. Uh, we found that also uh, MIS was uh, um, uh, the frequency of MIS was similar in patients with positive or negative DRB115, while lung involvement was significantly high in patients DRB115 positive, as well as hyperosinophilia and drug reaction. We have uh, four patients uh, with drug reaction in uh, with DL, DL, DRB115 positive. So look uh, at the lung disease uh, involvement. In our court, we have seven patients with lung involvement. Five of them were positive for the RB115. Again, the age at onset was younger in this group of patients. Um, um, and also the recurrence of MIS for higher, even the difference was not significant. These patients have more hyperosinophilia um, and drug reaction. We have three patients uh, who reacted to tocilizumab, uh, um, but very uh, close to, um, to the, um, the reaction occurred um, uh, very, uh, very fast between the first and the third administration of tocilizumab. And two of these patients, and all of these patients develop lung disease before the drug reaction. And we have one patient who, have, uh, who had drug reaction to anakindra having seven, after seven administration of anakindra. And, um, until now, he didn't develop lung involvement and is now here on the third year of follow-up. So, um, but how can we diagnose the uh, lung disease in SJA and how we can follow up and screen this patient? So, first of all, we need to assess some risk factors for this patient. Um, we, we need to take a look to uh, younger age at systemic GIA onset, the prevalence of systemic fissures, atypical pruritic rash, refractory cords, uh, MAS episode with recurrent episode. And uh, moreover, on the, the lab side, we, we need to mm, take, pay attention to hyperosinophilia, high hyaluronic level, elevated CXL9, and HLA DRB115 positive. Um, we need to look for clubbing that sometimes can uh, appear later. 
tachypnea, persistent dry cough, and we need to perform checks X-ray, particularly if, uh, if we suspect pneumonia, pulmonary functional tests, if possible, for the age of the patients, overnight pulse oximetry, and the um, high resolution um, CT scan. So how to treat? Actually, this is still a challenge. We actually don't know how to treat lung disease in SGIA. Uh, of course, conventional treatment for SGIA, glucocorticoid, probably we need to uh, increase the dose, but we don't know actually. Uh, the role of L1 and 6 inhibitor is uh, uh, discussing, as I said. Uh, probably based on the uh, T-cell plasticity hypothesis, uh, we need to add a, a T-cell targeting agent. Uh, and then we, we can, uh, we can use some targeting treatment such as uh, JAK inhibitors, anti-interferon gamma monoclonal antibody, the recombinant ileitin binding protein, and the B-specific A1 and ileitin monoclonal antibody. So we have some data that coming from a uh, single center experience. Uh, this is uh, um, a patient uh, with a refractory SGA with lung disease reported by the, the French colleague uh, that was treated with ruxolitinib. So the patient had um, a young disease uh, at onset, uh, failed anakinra ekanakinma, but was really dependent on glucocorticoid, had a recurrent MIS episode in lung disease, uh, and also developed an anaphylactic reaction after the second infusion of tosin. After ruxolitinib was started, the patient had no fever, uh, normalization of uh, um, uh, inflammatory biomarkers, decreased glucocorticoid, improvement on lung function, and the CT scan of fissures. Uh, this is one of our patients with systemic GIA and lung disease. The patient started uh, onset at 11 months, so was very young, with fever, polyarthritis, uh, very pruritic rash, uh, with fissures of uh, hyperinflammation. Uh, she had very frequent or recurrent MIS episode, so treatment, uh, different treatments were started, the glucocorticoid, several pulses, and uh, repetitive intraarticular injection, anakindra, cyclosporin, Canakinumab. Uh, then the lung disease uh, um, was diagnosed uh, with uh, uh, involvement and um, in, 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 in uh, severe involvement. So tocilizumab was started, but the patient immediately had a drug adverse reaction. Uh, so we added the mycophenolate mofetil and ruxolitinib. So after one year of treatment with Ruxo, the patient had some improvement in interstitial lung involvement, but of course the disease is not uh, well controlled. So this is a very recent case report uh, just uh, published on um, Frontiers in Pediatrics from some uh, um, US colleague who reported the case of one patient with uh, re refractory SGIA complicated MIS and lung disease that was treated with emapalumab and then uh, received hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So after emapalumab was started, the patient had complete disease control of systemic symptoms without recurrence of MIS episode. Then the patient received hematopoietic stem cell transplantation that show uh, a progressive improvement of lung disease and the patient was uh, able to uh, discontinue the, the glucocorticoid treatment. Uh, this is another case from the Cincinnati group, is one patient with lung disease duration, again interstitial lung disease, severe MIS episode treated with the uh, Tadekinig, recombinant IL-18 binding protein. So the patient had a stabilization of disease with reduced severity of the MIS episode, and, um, the glucocorticoid was separated and the patient had improvement on linear growth. And this is another uh, very recently reported case um, from the US uh, colleagues. Uh, this, this patient uh, uh, again had a refractory systemic GIA uh, arthritis with lung disease uh, that was receiving a number uh, of drugs, as you can see here. Then uh, started the, the um, IL-1, IL-18 blockaded, MAS A25, that was administered every two weeks, and every two weeks, and the patient had a, a progressive improvement on the uh, functional, pulmonary functional uh, test. So to conclude, uh, how can we diagnose interstitial lung disease? So, uh, I hope we can uh, identify some diagnostic tips uh, during this, uh, this talk. So in dermatomyositis, in juvenile dermatomyositis, we look for an interstitial lung disease in those patients with autoantibody related to lung involvement. Uh, in savvy patients, we look for uh, interstitial lung disease in any patient with or without skin involvement. 
as well as in COPA, but we have to take in mind that uh, COPA patients are usually onset with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and the interstitial line disease is a later manifestation. In systemic GIA, we need to look for ILD in those patients with early disease onset, prevalence of systemic fissures, refractory cords, recurrent MIS, hyperosinophilia, very high gallatin levels, uh, and we need to take in, um, uh, in mind that clubbing, cuffing, and dyspnea can be late. So the majority of these patients can be asymptomatic at onset. So, of course, uh, we, we still have uh, to learn a lot. We probably know just uh, a, a small part of this, uh, of this condition, uh, of this complication of, of different uh, pediatric rheumatology disease. So, I would like to thank to all the rheumatology division at the Rheumatology Rub in Rome at Bambino Gesù Children Hospital, all the collaborators from the Pediatric uh, Rheumatology European Society and uh, the Systemic Joy Foundation to support our project. And uh, thank you for your kind attention, and uh, I'm now open for your question. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia, for this wonderful um, presentation, very clear, as always, and also for being perfectly in time. So we have still uh, 15 minutes for, um, uh, for questions. So um, to all the attendees, you can uh, post the questions either in the chat section or in the question section on um, the GoToWebinar. We have uh, received um, a couple of questions beforehand. Maybe it's best uh, that I start uh, with, with that. So here's a question from Inita Bulina, uh, I think from Latvia. Um, and um, she is actually uh, proposing uh, or wondering whether uh, you, Claudia, or maybe Alice, you can help have ideas on how to create an algorithm for immune diseases with interstitial lung disease and a possible progression to lung fibrosis. Or, and specifically to the question with when and what patients um, are in need of adding antifibrotic medicines? I think a very interesting question, but probably difficult to uh, answer. Um, are you aware, Claudia, of any uh, algorithms or um, flowcharts that are already uh, existing? And um, you have taught us something about the treatment, which is all immune directed, but is there a place for antifibrotic drugs? Yeah, so um, uh, in my knowledge, there are no algorithms right now available to. Uh, to diagnose and to follow up this patient. But uh, I mean, we can identify some, some tips uh, for the lung involvement, uh, as, as I show in the last slide, uh, at least in the, the, the disease that I have discussed. Uh, regarding the treatment, yes, I, I discussed about the immunosuppressive treatment. There are actually no data on the use of antifibrosis in uh, lung disease, uh, in rheumatic, in um, immunomediated disease. And uh, yeah, probably this is the, the next step we, we we need to uh, to learn probably more from our uh, bronchopneumologists uh, that are more uh, um, experienced in the use of the antifibrotic uh, drug in this uh, in this condition than us. So maybe Alice Hachuel, um, because of that reason, you can comment on this. Do you have experience in uh, adding yes, antifibrotic drugs? So uh, hi everybody. So for maybe some do not know me, so I am a pediatric pulmonologist. I'm not a pediatric rheumatologist in Paris. Uh, so we have no algorithm as well for um, diagnose or to, to detect lung disease in such patients. But um, I think it is important to keep in mind that in some of those patients, especially with uh, uh, juvenile dermatomyositis, uh, arthritis and those patients sometimes they will have um, delay, uh, a delayed appearance of respiratory signs, especially shortness of breath with exercise because they will not do as much exercise as you would expect from another normal children with no disease according to their um, limitation in exercise because of their uh, limitations in movements because of their muscles or joint involvement so you can be late. And this is why uh, in my center, uh, we are um, 
I think we are a bit systematic. That means that for uh, dermatitis anxiety, systemic sclerosis, lupus, and uh, arthritis, we easily uh, do uh, at least a chest X-ray uh, and sometimes a chest CT, and also lung function tests as as soon as the children are able to do it, because we had some cases of uh, really asymptomatic uh, lung lesions in CT with already. Uh, beginning fibrotic lesions with the patients being no or really poorly symptomatic. So this is the first comment uh, regarding the use of antifibrotic medicines. Uh, there has been some studies in adult patients with systemic sclerosis and natinamib, which is the specific antifibrotic drug. There is no uh, data in children yet. Um, one. Um, there is a, uh, recently a clinical trial uh, to study essentially the, the uh, security, but also the efficacy of uh, natinidine in fibrosing ILD in children, whatever the cause. So in some of those patients, uh, the cause uh, are connective disease and results are uh, encouraging, but uh, I, in France, there is no authorization for using those medications in children. So I don't have much experience, uh, but I think that in uh, in some years, not so, not so, not in the in the near future, we'll have, I think, access to nitrogen for uh, such patients. Thank you very much, Alice, for this um, really helpful addition. Very little experience, but um, I think one of the Things we also can learn from this, uh, Claudia, and please comment for that, that if you have a patient with interstitial lung disease um, in the context of a rare auto-inflammatory or a quiet auto-inflammatory or immune-mediated disease, please contact an expert center uh, as early as possible because the experience is very uh, little so far. Um, these patients then can be added um, uh, to the known registries, the European registries that are right now, and we have to learn from that uh, from them because we want to improve treatments. Right. I have another question on the chat uh, beforehand. Um, uh, physician um, remembers a, a couple of severe cases of. Um, of uh, interstitial lung disease, one in the context of large facial vasculitis and one in the context of uh, adult onset still disease, which is, uh, of course, the equivalent, adult equivalent of systemic GAA. And both of these patients had very severe cough. Um, can you comment, Claudia? Is, is, is cough maybe a marker of lung involvement in, um, in, um, in these uh, type of diseases and in what stage? So. Of course, cough is a, is a common symptom, but not so common in children because uh, the majority of children in, uh, with lung disease uh, are asymptomatic. So when they become symptomatic, the disease progression is, pro is probably uh, um, go, go ahead. So it, it's, it's quite late, it's already late. So uh, we need to think to lung disease uh, without symptoms because uh, uh, children are almost uh, asymptomatic at onset. I agree uh, with that. Any additional comments, uh, Alice, maybe from a yes, pulmonology point of view? That, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, when, when there is a cough, the first thing to rule out is an infection because those children are under immunosuppressive drugs. So before thinking of interstitial lung disease, you have to rule out an infection. And usually uh, I agree with Claudia that when the cough appears, it may be too late because you can see like a a really uh, recurrent drive cough uh, when there is already lung fibrosis. So. Yeah, so this points to a rather late in manifestation. Yeah, I agree. I have another question, Claudia. I was very intrigued by the different um, potential immune mechanisms. We, and, uh, I agree that we have to learn a lot uh, on these patients, but what strikes me is that not only in systemic GIA related uh, ILD, um, but also in the other um, types of ILD that you mentioned, there seems to be a role of both IL-18 and interferon gamma. 
And I was intrigued by the papers uh, in Juvenile Dermatomyositis, where you showed um, a paper of 2018 with increased uh, interferon gamma levels. Was that in serum of the patient or in the bowel fluid of the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid of the patient? Because I, I remember no, that I... in the setting of, of systemic DIA, it's very difficult to measure interferon gamma me uh, levels. We have actually to, to switch to CXL9 or 10 to know whether the interferon gamma pathway is active or not, because it's difficult to measure in serum. Can you comment? Right, right. I agree with you. Uh, this is why interferon gamma is mostly in the tissue compared to CXL9, that is a chemokine induced by interferon gamma, and that is most simple to find in the serum. So the data from the um, dermatomyositis, there are data from adult patients. Uh, the level are from serum, so interf are interferon gamma serum levels. And uh, yeah, I agree with you that that is quite strange, but that they found it. But they also found uh, are different paper, but they also found the neopterin that is induced again from interferon gamma and dilatin. So uh, this is a really interesting uh, uh, feature to understand better in the future for the to understand the pathogenesis of the lung disease of dermatomyositis. So seems to be a link in the pathogenesis of lung involvement, at least in the disease that I have uh, discussed today. Uh, I have one question. Uh, if there is no more in the chat or in the... I don't, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Um, so, Claudia, uh, what, uh, what would be your, uh, your, your list uh, in order of... Uh, uh, what, for, for instance, in patients with uh, SGIA-related uh, lung disease uh, that already had uh, an adverse re reaction on the uh, anti-IL-1 and IL-6 uh, drugs, what would be your first choice to treat the, uh, the lung disease? Okay, so uh, for sure, even the patient had a not severe breast and uh, I didn't uh, uh, see any patient with dress in my court. Uh, I continue IL-1 and 6 inhibitor. And uh, probably uh, based on the um, uh, T cell plasticity hypothesis that is very uh, interesting. Uh, a T cell target drug can be added. So uh, we did um, uh, with some patient. We added uh, mycophenolate. Actually, we don't know which is the best drug in this uh, uh, in this way. We can use uh, uh, cyclosporin, uh, mycophenolate, or sirolimus. Uh, um, but actually, we don't know which which works better. We, the data are very are very few, limited to some cases. And, um, and so we, 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 we now have some new drug, as I showed, we can uh, access to emapalumab, to the anti-interferon gamma uh, monoclonal antibody, and probably also the IL-1 and IL-18 blockade drug can be uh, another good option for this patient. But uh, again, data are very few. So uh, um, it's quite difficult to, to have uh, a, a clear single uh, suggestion for every patient. So every patient is different to have consider many aspects, uh, the systemic uh, features, the uh, joint involvement, the recurrence of MIS, and the kind of lung disease. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a still a challenging and we actually don't know which is the best treatment for this patient. So this is why we need to collect uh, uh, most patients as possible in registry to understand uh, uh, more and more on the disease and uh, its, tre its treatment. Yeah, again, I think this is really important um, uh, and really to, to um to stress to the audience, if you have patients with suspected or confirmed interstitial lung disease in the context of systemic DIA, please contact Claudia. Uh, that can be done by email. She uh, leads the uh, uh, press initiative on, uh, on the, the registry of this. Are there any more questions in the chat? I don't see them. If not, I think we can close this meeting, but not before announcing that uh, next month's meeting, so four weeks from now on May 2nd, there will be another ERM Rita webinar. The topic then is uh, on genetic screening. How do I use uh, genetic screening, either um, uh, a gene panel or um, uh, whole exome uh, sequencing? And that will be presented by Dr. Isabel Meitz from the University Hospital in Leuven in Belgium. 
So please subscribe for next month's meeting. Claudia and Alice, thank you very much for um, uh, your presentation and co-chairing with me. And I wish you a very pleasant working day. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Bas. Thank you, Alice. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.